Another week has come and gone, and uh, I can just say the exact same thing for the Apple news currently happening right now. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but it's interesting that we get more and more sort of confirmation on the leaks. Like, they seem to be sort of materializing more and more, but in terms of, like, new info, it's been uh, slim pickings around here dry. in terms of new stuff. But yeah. actually, there's a couple of little tidbits we'll get into about the uh, AR VR headset, iPhone 14. Uh, the uh, design has supposedly been finalized and all that stuff. And some other news and interesting things we'll get into in this episode. So don't worry, we still got a good episode lined up for you guys. But first, as always, we want to hear from you guys. If you have a question, you have a comment, you've got a tip or trick you'd like to share about the iPhone or the Mac, which we will talk about uh, very soon, let us know. You can dial us at the Apple Circle hotline, which is 94 94- nine three five four three five zero eight you can call that number you can text that number or you can drop us a comment on uh the youtube channel which is the apple circle podcast just search that up you can watch video versions of the episode you can see clips all that fun stuff is happening online matt how you doing this week doing good i mean like you said a little sn- slow on the news week but i i'm kind of excited to talk about some of the things that are coming up i mean should we just start, though, M2, spring events, kind of the same thing we've been talking about, like you said. Just materialize a little bit more, getting reaffirmed. Apparently, Mark Gurman came out with his newsletter, has a lot of juicy details about when we're going to see these products, which the products themselves, we've kind of heard all about, but now when are we going to actually see well, them? So what, what, what are we gonna, what's the news here? Interestingly enough, I feel like some of our uh, hypotheses have come correct, or at least they seem like they're going to come correct, because... Didn't we say that Apple should split up the Mac Mini? This was a while ago, not just last week, but weeks ago. They should do a pro version and a regular version. I feel like we talked oh, about I've that always, a couple months ago. Well, that and I, I mentioned that in the last episode. I think that's actually the clip that just went up before this episode on the YouTube channel uh, was basically about that. In my mind, there's two versions of the Mac Mini that are going to exist here. The regular Mac Mini with the colors and then like a pro version with the high power chips. Is that kind of what we're expecting now that looks like that is uh what is going to be the case this year in 2022 so mark german like i mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago we're getting like more confirmation on these leaks so like we haven't gotten a lot of new info but like more sources are coming together to say hey this is what's going to come this year and specifically here's what should be coming at the spring event so according to mark german who's got a very good track record he expects a couple of new m2 max this year in 2022 not launching at the spring event but this is going to come throughout the uh remainder of the year so there's going to be an m2 macbook air that's the one with the big redesign should be great not coming at the spring event maybe in the fall or maybe wwdc we don't know what's going to happen there but it's not coming at the spring event um a 24 inch imac with an m2 processor so that was something we also discussed a number of weeks ago including last week about what apple would do it looks like they are going to update the imac with the m2 according to uh, mark german over at bloomberg uh a base entry level 30 13-inch MacBook Pro with M2. So another thing we talked about that should be coming at the spring event. No real exciting stuff with that. Just the same chassis, but just with the new processor inside. A new, uh, well, I guess this is an M2, but a new you know, Apple Silicon Mac Pro that is also coming this year. And then um, a higher-end iMac Pro is coming this year. And then last but not least, with the M2 line in terms of Macs, we're expecting a M2 Mac Mini and a M2, he didn't say Mac Mini Pro, but well, I shouldn't say, uh, let me rewind a bit. M2 Mac Mini, that is going to be a case, looking like it's going to be a consumer level focused device. And then we also have heard, Mark Irwin didn't say Mac Mini Pro, but a more pro tier with the M1 Pro and M1 Mac. So basically this year, it looks like most Macs are going to get the M2 option. And then some, specifically the iMac Pro and the Mac Mini, uh, and I guess if you count the the Mac Pro is kind of a, it's in its own separate bucket. Basically, the iMac Pro and the Mac Mini will also get some M1 Pro and M1 Max variants as well. So lots of new Macs launching this year, uh, lots of new M2 Macs. But again, the only M2 Mac coming very soon is that new entry level MacBook Pro and then the Mac Mini. Those are the two that we expect to see at the spring event. Matt, did I miss anything? Was that that was a lot to sort of digest? There's a lot of M2s, M1s, and pros, it, yeah. and I feel like it's going to get confusing as we move forward. That in some cases it might seem like the anything M1, whatever um, you know, anything that follows that seems like it's inferior to the M2, but that's not the case, and that's going to be right. a little weird to wrangle with this year. 
Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, you get the Mac Mini with the M2 chip, and then you're going to get the M1 Pro and Max chip that are actually better, but it's still the M1, which also means that you know there's an M2 Pro slash Max coming. So it's like, when should you buy? I don't know. It, it's kind of confusing. But I'm excited to see these products. I think you and I are both in the market for a Mac Mini. Uh, I mean, honestly... I probably might end up getting a regular Mac Mini, you know, this non-pro tier, just because I need, I want a house computer for like the basement, and I like spending money, which we always talk <laughs> about here. <laughs> um, but I know you're you're interested in getting like this pro level Mac Mini. You know? See, uh, now I go so back and forth because now my dream has become I'd love a stationary Mac at my desk, and then I just would like a MacBook Pro or something to like take around with me. Just like I'd like yeah. to have. A laptop and I have a laptop but it's always docked so I've been like going back and forth like well would my dream be like to get like a pro spec Mac mini and just have that because I already have the monitors and the speakers and all that and then just use this MacBook Pro uh, as a laptop or because this is like a really nicely spec MacBook Pro do I want to try to get like some cheaper, you know, used MacBook Air or something? But then at that point, when I was kind of looking, I was just, you know, casually looking eBay on to see what was around. It's like, well, if the new one's going to be around a thousand dollars, it's like, it's like the couple of hundred dollars you'd maybe save. It seems like whatever the difference would be might be well worth it with this new Mac, uh, MacBook Air just because the design's going to get overhauled, better screen with mini LED, better camera, stuff like that. So, at this point, I'm just going to keep waiting to see what happens, but uh, definitely the uh, Pro and Mac Mini has crossed my mind just a bit, and especially for the price. I mean, if this thing is going to be well under $2,000, presumably, you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck here. Exactly. That's, I think that's the biggest thing with the Mac Mini is the bang for buck, because as excellent as this MacBook Pro is, and I absolutely love it, I've done some more intensive edits on it, and it is it flies, no issues. I think the last project, the project I did last was... Uh, Blackmagic Ursa ProRes footage, so that of course is going to work great. Um, then in the same project was R5 footage and C70 footage from Canon. So that's all H.265, which on the previous computers, non-Apple Silicon, I mean, it's it's a pain. You basically have to retranscode everything into ProRes for it to work smoothly. But with a native H.265 encoding on this, um, or decoding, I guess you'd say, um, on this M1 Max chip that I have now I didn't have to do any of that and it all was like butter so I mean that power is amazing and the laptop is great to have but there's a lot of times where I don't need the screen I don't need the built-in yeah. keyboard or trackpad like give me the power in a box for a much more affordable price because this is an expensive laptop so you know sub 2000 even if it's like 1800 that's still an excellent deal in my mind well that's the thing too is like I feel so bad because there's a very brief time when my daughter was first born that I unplugged the laptop. I took it downstairs and I use it as a laptop. And man, I was like, the screen's great. The keyboard's fantastic. This is really nice to have. But when I'm working, I like to have the bigger monitor. I like to have more screens and, you know, more space to sort of spread out and screen real estate and stuff like that. And in that case, you can like have the laptop open. I don't know. Do you have the laptop sort of open on the side where you still have that screen? Uh, or I know some I people, my wife, she works with like the laptop in front of the screen. So she uses the trackpad yeah. and keyboard on the laptop and then a screen I've behind her. Before. How do yeah. you do it? I've done everything before. Right now, I'm just down to one 27-inch monitor. I've got the laptop off to the side plugged in through Thunderbolt. Um, I had it originally when like the MacBook first came out. I, I made that setup, which we kind of talked about, which was... Uh, this 27 inch monitor with the laptop next to it so I could use that screen and I just rearranged everything as I like to do every five seconds and <laughs> moved it over there but what I have noticed is I think it's just because it's a new laptop and I love it and it's so good uh, is that I have been unplugging it more and taking it with me downstairs like you said and like actually using it as a laptop which I never ever did with the 16 inch MacBook Pro I had before I this the Intel version probably i mean honestly it was probably because it was just too big and i hated mm. carrying that 16 inch laptop around now that i have the 14 inch it's like it's great and i love it but also the keyboard is so good the screen is so, so good. good like everything about this laptop is excellent um so i'm in the same boat like at some point whether it's the mac mini pro or the imac pro because we're expecting both this year i'm going to be upping my setup here with um, a desktop computer, and then I'm going to use the MacBook Pro as a MacBook Pro as a laptop. Point being, I've got too many devices, but I really just want a desktop experience and a laptop experience that I can go between. And I think finally this year we're going to actually get that. 
I mean, I feel like things fluctuate all the time. And I agree. It's like after using that MacBook Pro and just, I, guess, I think it's just that combo of the screen is so good and the keyboard is so good that I would rather inconvenience myself by unplugging those cables and taking it than using the iPad. And I still love the iPad and I still use the iPad right. every day, yeah. but I find myself, I, still love it. Yeah. I use it way more for content conception exactly. than I do yep. typing things down. I don't know. It just, I don't know what it is. And there's those ebbs and flows, but maybe with yeah, I'm sure iOS we'll, we'll 16, go back, but... yeah, I, I, well, I'm that's hoping with iPad I'm... OS and exactly. That's kind of what I'm thinking is like, at this point, for for me at least, Apple needs to do something with iPad OS for me to really care about the um, iPad Pro again. Because yeah, I'm in the same boat. It's much more of a consumption device, and um, the only thing I really use it for is like when we have meetings and stuff. I'll pull it up. I'll use that for like just so I can like write notes and stuff with the Apple Pencil. But I mean, yeah, I'm in the same boat. It's it's a nice. It's still a great device, right? But the iPad Pro in specific is meaningless at this point. If I was redoing everything, I'd be buying the iPad Air or the iPad Mini like mm. have because it does everything that I would need it to do. The Pro line of iPads right now is meaningless to me. That's I mean, true. I don't know if you Actually, feel the same boat. That's like now, now that I think about it, it's kind of a good point. I mean, unless you really like that display, there's nothing. What could the iPad Pro do that the iPad Air cannot currently do? Because like that we mentioned before, Apple you've Pencil, got... That's it. Well, the iPad and Air has an Apple... Uh, Pencil sport. Oh, I, you said MacBook Air, I think, or maybe. Oh, iPad sorry, Air. no, I, I iPad Air versus <laughs> iPad Pro. Yeah, no, there's nothing except for yeah. the M1 chip, which theoretically is faster, but like, who cares? And it, we we have yet to see any application really take advantage of that in a meaningful way. And Apple has imported over Mac app, so what's the point? So, I mean, we've gone down this road before. There's a, a limiting factor here, and the problem, I think, really the problem with the iPad Pro is Apple. Apple has capped it for whatever reason exactly. from reaching its potential and it's sort of stuck in limbo is just sort of this higher end tablet that's nice you know to have a nicer screen but that's sort of it so anyways i well, digress yeah i don't know I, I could talk about the ipad pro for hours because one last thing on it the the fact that it's the it's the pro in specific the ipad line i think is great it's just the pro in specific because if i'm going to be spending i did the calculation yesterday or last night because i was doing let me pull it up actually so i can get the number correct uh, if I was going to do the Mac iPad Pro as as a uh, full desktop experience or as much as you can with the iPad Pro. So that means 12.9 uh, because you want a bigger display, right? Kind of competi competing with mm -hmm. the MacBook Air. You want the Magic Keyboard because obviously you get the trackpad and keyboard. That transforms the way you use the iPad. So let me pull it up here. But the price for a 12.9 inch iPad Pro um, with 256 gigs, so it's not the base storage, but let's be real, you're going to need a little bit more. It is $1,627, mm. if I can read my hand handwriting correct. Um, so that's 1600 bucks. The price for a MacBook Air and an iPad Mini or a iPad Air, um, $100 difference between the Mini and the Air, Air being more expensive, is... Uh, where did I write? Okay, maybe I didn't calculate this. Maybe I didn't write it down, but basically nine ninety nine for the MacBook Air and four ninety nine for the iPad Mini. Oh, so you're in the same down. ballpark. Yeah, hands down, better. I would do the MacBook Air and the uh, iPad Air or iPad Mini. I mean, either of those just seems way more versatile than your maxed out iPad Pro setup. Exactly, and it's like okay, argument being, I love the screen on the iPad Pro. Sure, I mean, yeah, great, but is it worth that? The other argument would be like, well, M one chip. Well, MacBook Air has the same M1 chip and it has all the other Pro features. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So I'm excited to see what Apple does. I'm hoping they do something. I hope it's not just MagSafe on the back. Didn't really intend to get into the iPad Air, but I've been thinking about iPad for a long time because, yeah. like I said, it's just been sitting there and I pick it up not nearly as often as I used to. So I mean, you make a good point because just the, the more I think about it now, it's like, well, based off of how I've used the iPad Pro lately, if I'm just watching stuff on it, why wouldn't I just go with the air if I had to do it all over again? Save the money, get the air. It's just as good. I'm not, I'm not sitting down and watching movies on that for three hours. I'm like taking it with me to the gym and watching YouTube on it and like you know casual stuff like that. So I don't. I, I it's the iPad Pro is just it's such a great device that was so nice to see get refreshed a few years ago. But now as the other iPad options have gotten much better, and iPad OS has seemingly gotten it's reached its sort of cap, so to speak. Uh, it's just going to be interesting to see what Apple does and what new uh, features they can unlock. Because especially if the rumors are true, they're going to put the M2 inside. 
what is the point of this M2 processor if it cannot add, what tangible functionality or feature does this M2 processor give you that you cannot get in an A-series chip with the iPad Air because I have yet to find something really meaningful with it. Right, and the the argument is, the argument would be that you can't obviously use a touchscreen and the Apple Pencil on a MacBook Air, but for the same price as a comparably, you know, usable iPad Pro, you can get both. So yeah, it doesn't make sense. Speaking of things that need to be updated or maybe don't need to be updated, iPod Touch. So Oof. it was uh, it was reported, which um, f- from Mac rumors that basically we are on the thousand day uh, life cycle now of the iPod Touch, which wouldn't blame me if you didn't know the iPod Touch existed still because Apple does not want you to know this. Or before the show, I was like looking for it on their website. And not only do you... Uh, have to go finding it but it's not at the top bar it's not in one of the menus you basically have to scroll all the way to the bottom where it says like shop and learn it's got kind of you know at the bottom of websites they have all these different links for pretty much everything and right there at the near the bottom of that section you've got the ipod touch so yeah this thing has been around for a long time the last of the ipods and just looking at it i mean this is not what i would consider an ipod in the uh, classical sense but what do you think ipod is it going to be dead soon do you think they're just going to keep it around forever like what, what's going to go on with this every year? I think I've always asked the question myself. And I'm sure many of you guys out there have, is this year the iPod dies? And I, it's so complicated because there are like a number of different factors here. On one hand, of course it should. I mean the iPod or not the iPod. Well, the iPad and the iPhone have totally eclipsed the functionality of the iPod touch. Not even getting to the iPod lineup. Just like let's talk recently here with the iPod touch. The iPod touch was introduced as the next step, the next evolution of the iPod line, really to give people who wanted the functionality of the iPhone but couldn't afford it or who had a different phone or who couldn't join AT&T or who didn't want to pay the money, whatever it was, you got all the same functionality of the iPhone without the phone app. It was a really great value for its time and really was a great way to give a lot of people that magic and sort of their first taste of the iPhone and that iPhone experience Without an iPhone. The iPod Touch was great when it launched in what, 2007, 2008? It was right around the launch of the iPhone iPhone. came the iPod Touch. And we did a video on the John Render channel not too long ago. I want to say like in 2019 about like, I think it was called It's Time for the iPod to Die or something around that. Like it was just like, why does the iPod Touch exist? And I was surprised at the number of comments people left about how, oh, I buy it for my kids. It's still great to have this and that. Like, obviously, there is a small number of people who still love the iPod Touch. But from a practical stance, why? Why keep this around? Obviously, if you look on Apple's website, it has the A10 processor. They still tout it as having um, iOS 14 as their latest and greatest software on there, which is not, it's still, a, it's a year old. It's not super old, but not as old as the A10 inside. But um, super old specs, Lower resolution cameras, I think it's an 8 megapixel camera or a 10 megapixel camera. It's not even a 12 megapixel camera. I think it's a 1.2 megapixel selfie camera on the front. Uh, I might be, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that's what the tech specs say. It's just, it's it's been a thousand days since the update. I'm looking on Mac rumors. The uh, previous update uh, windows were 233 days, 103 days, 289, 384, 743 was the other really long stretch. So uh, what is that? Over two years ish or so until an update 670, 404. And now this is by far the longest stretch, a thousand days since an update. When I look at how Apple positions the iPod touch and how it sort of stacks up to the current lineup now, I can't find a meaningful solution to keep it around or a meaningful purpose besides just like nostalgia. Like it's just, it's the last iPod. Apple's got to keep that alive, maybe just for nostalgia's sake. Um, But I think that it would not be, uh, who is it hurting by just sort of ending that chapter in Apple's history? I don't know. What do you think, man? I just, I, I can't find a rational reason to keep the iPod touch around. I mean, the only thing I can think of is what you said, where it's the most affordable Apple iOS device. It's uh, 199, which is very affordable for, I guess, what you're getting. Like you're getting the full iOS experience, even though it is very dated, um, but you get the latest software and everything, right? So it's not, it's not like you're not getting a decent experience for that 199. I guess the next cheapest above that would be the uh, iPhone SE, which is 499, 425. What is it? Three. I think it's 399. 
So it's in that 400 range, whatever yeah. it is. Um, so, I mean, that is quite a considerable jump. That's a $200, I mean, almost ha- uh, two times as expensive. Um, so, in that sense, I get it. But, I mean, at this point, you're better off just buying a used iPhone or something, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, um, And then, I guess, yeah, yeah, nostalgia is another one. I mean, it would be really sad to see the iPad, or I sorry, iPod, uh, be completely killed. And what what's... Uh, what do they call it? Or I want to say archived, but there's a word that I can't think of right now. Um, vintage. That's what I was going to think. Like officially the iPod is now a vintage product. According to Apple, uh, that day will come because unless they plan on updating the iPod, well, at some point they're not going to support this a 10 processor inside. So it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when, what was, so for me, the iPod was my first, uh, Apple product ever. Um, I think, which one was it? It was the first iPod with video um, right around when Pirates of the Caribbean was out. That's all I remember. It was before the iPhone. It was like 2005-ish, 2006. 2004, 2005, something. Yeah, maybe 2006, something in there. Um, And I I mean, that opened my eyes to the world of technology because I didn't know something like that existed. So for me, the iPod definitely holds a uh, soft spot in my heart. What about you? Did you ever have an iPod? That was the same for me. It was that first, whatever that video iPod was, we got it at Costco. I remember my mom and my sister got one and I started to sort of play around with it. And like, I wasn't into music so much, but watching videos on there was super cool and the games. And there was something so cool and something so unique and different about that, that um, sort of really opened my eyes into the Apple ecosystem. And I remember after that, that's when I got on my whole, oh, I need to get a MacBook thing. I need to get um, this computer that's um, black and can run Comic Life and has a photo booth and all this cool stuff. And it was the iPod we're, we originally the exact, that was, I know, it's not the crazy? exact same story. That's so funny. Yeah, because my, I don't know why we got the iPod. Because like when I say I didn't care about technology, I really meant I don't, I didn't care about technology. I didn't know anything about it. And for whatever reason, my parents decided to get an iPod. Um, I guess at the time my dad was, pretty into technology still is but like whatever uh yeah so we got that first ipod and then that is what really opened my eyes and the same the black macbook with the uh i'm not you might have gotten it before me mine had the core 2 duo maybe yours had the core no, mine, duo I'm not, no it was i think it was the core 2 duo i got it in january right, no, it was either. a june of 2007 i think or may or june that of 2007 right, is when yeah. i got it so with tiger um, and the, like no opens up and, oh, so i just Great that memories. was classic uh classic mac oh no it was mac os 10 days and i remember yeah. the huge jump from tiger to leopard leopard was the total oh, redesign and huge. it looked so cool and that translucent dock on the bottom and uh just i have so many fond memories of older macs and i've wanted to like um dig out the older mac or i'd love to if i had like unlimited money and unlimited space i'd love to set up just like an older classic mac setup just give me like an older Ooh. mac mini with one of those nice big 30 inch cinema displays put leopard on I there or tiger on and <laughs> i know isn't that i saw a video on it. i think it was um luke Mike, miani or luke miani. yeah, yeah that's he did was. a video and, and then i started looking into what it would take to put that together and um those are well, you just give nice me because i've i've got some space and okay you gotta put I it together for me let me let me live vicariously through you. Get a nice, get one of those 30 inch displays and then get like an old Mac to pair with it. I'm, I'm sure you could find mm. like, uh, yeah, well, it There's needs to, to support dual link, dual link DVI. So I don't know if I'm sure an well, older Mac adap- Mini could do it. There's some adapters you can get yeah. that would probably work. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll make it work. I'll figure it out. Put I'm it together. Into this. But, uh, I, that's what I remember. Um, someone I knew a friend had it when I first that was how I first stupid story first learned about the whole dual monitor thing he had two of the 22 or 23 inch apple cinema display side by side and that was the first time I learned about dragging a window from left to right and what that was like and then that got me on like oh I gotta have a monitor to hook up to my laptop and it just went downhill from there but um that was just uh, that Time for me definitely carries a lot of nostalgia. It was like that 2005 through 2008. That was, you know, when the iPhone was unveiled and launched and Apple was doing so many things. And I definitely, I I am a nostalgic Apple fan. But with that being said, uh, with the iPod Touch, do you think they're even making new iPod Touches? Do you think they just made a batch and they're just, they've got an inventory of them and they're just sort of slowly parceling them out because... um, I know you can buy it from Apple. Can you go to other retailers and buy an iPod Touch? I don't think so, right? You I'm have sure. to go to Apple uh, to... I don't know. I got to look. I'm going to look up... Like, Let's go to Best Buy. Yeah, look, look at Best right Buy now. and Target, but I'm just thinking about it. I mean, now, I mean, 
like you said, it, there is a, a value there for $200. It's great for a teen, a kid, someone who wants to have that iPhone experience, but you don't want to give them your phone. $200 is a nominal amount of money that you could spend to give someone a fairly good little mini, it's like a mini tablet, basically, to have the iOS experience. Well, that's experience. what I was about to say, actually. Like, I'd probably rather get my kid, if if I'm already set on getting them a device, which you know some people don't want to do anyway, but if I'm going to get my kid a device, then isn't the base iPad better? Even though, yes, it's slightly more expensive, like 30 bucks more. Or maybe it's 130 bucks more through. Yeah, I think it's yeah it's a little uh, bit more expensive, but I mean, but the iPads are better because then you can. There's more educational opportunities. I feel like. Oh, with the iPad, I mean, please. you get there's a better uh, a better accessory market. You're getting a much more modern processor and much more modern display. And there's I could tell you 20 reasons why that 129 dollars is much better spent going with the uh, I. Uh, uh, the iPad, the base iPad. And then even then, if you wanted the iPhone, man, for, okay, it's $200 to go from the uh, iPod Touch to the iPhone. I see if you like wanted that as like a secondary device. But again, the camera's significantly better. It's going to have the newer processor. There's just many reasons. I, I can think of too many reasons to not go with the iPod Touch than to recommend it. I just, I know that there are, are people out there who still value it and like it, but I don't know what the... Um, what the real value is these days of Apple keeping it around. Yeah, exactly. And I just looked, Best Buy does sell it. Um, wow. But you do not want to go there because for 32 gigabytes, which is the base model, uh, it's 229 So you're getting a better deal if you go to Apple. I don't know why it's 229 at Best Buy. That doesn't make They must sense. just have such limited stock. Or I, I'd still love to know, because uh, I remember the last time we did that John Renger video, I went to the Apple store to buy it and i remember i had to ask for it they didn't even have any on the on the f the store floor you had, they had to go and get it from the back and i'd love to know how many people are actually walking in there and buying um ipod touches i would say it's very very slim but for some reason whatever it is apple's keeping it around but uh a thousand days since the last update that's like the older mac pro those are those are uh, uh high numbers there without an update so i i think that um let me ask you this matt a thousand days since the last update do you think the iPod Touch gets one more update, or is it just, this is it? I think this is it. They're just going to keep it on as long as they can. And I mean, the iPod is such a big line. I mean, basically, it's what saved Apple. Um, or maybe not saved exactly, but like definitely brought them into prominence again. They got to say something when they actually, you know, vintage the line. They can't just like see and be quiet about it. I feel like they got to say something. Um, and do they... Yeah, so I think it's going to happen, but we might be a few years out for it. Um, I was just looking, by the way, another great reason to get the iPad for your child or whoever is, well, actually, my 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 idea is falling apart. Never mind. I was going to say because the storage, base storage on the iPod is 32 gigabytes, um, and the base storage on the iPad is 64, but for 299 still cheaper than the iPad, you can get 128. So that, that argument did not fly. But yeah. I just... Uh, the iPod. I want to love it. Whether I, I want to love it. <laughs> well, yeah, that. I mean, there's certain things I could actually think of doing with it. Like, for instance, I mean, I would never buy this for this right now. But if they updated it, I could definitely see using it as like a home theater remote or something like that. I mean, that's a possibility I can I can use for it. Um, but as it sits now, like I'm not buying this. Um, but yeah, We'll see. I think time will tell. We're we're still. I think the Mac Pro trash can is still the longest uh, refresh cycle that we've seen. I think it was over two thousand days. Let's see what it says in the article here. Two thousand one hundred eighty-two days for that trash can Oof. Mac Pro that it sat there. So I mean, we're not even close to that. So I think until we hit hit that point, I could easily see this thing sticking around. Um, but yeah, iPod fond memories and. Uh, It'll be sad when it goes, but right now, I honestly don't care. I'm more interested in buying like a... I, I've thought about this a lot. I've seen some other people do this. Is buying... I, I was just thinking about buying that iPod again that I had that I started with because mine actually got stolen, so I don't have it. Otherwise, I'd probably uh -oh. still have it. But yeah, uh -oh. so I... I, I saw well, was it the it the Knoopsy video where he bought the original iPod and then he was showing how oh, it works yeah. and I yeah, look exactly. I, I I'm all for nostalgia that seems like a ton of work to go through all that but <laughs> I do like the idea of again um, if I had sort of a, a, a 
a side hobby where I had a couple of thousand dollars, I'd love to go back and buy some of my favorite older Apple devices. I want to, I'd love to go back and I have that old black MacBook, but it's like the battery shot. I'd love to restore that. I'd love to get my older Mac Pro working I had from uh, 2010. I'd love to get uh, an original iPhone and I'd love to build up like a vintage older Apple collection just of like working products just to sort of have an experience. And so every so often I'll find like an older Mac and boot it up and I just... Just something yeah. so fun about that. I'll never, I remember um, like getting the software updates before they were through the App Store. You'd have to go to the Apple Store and buy them the discs. Oh, uh, just yeah, those were the days. Different times. I mean, I, I've started doing that. I have the uh, original Mac, which does work. I've never tried to make it work just because I haven't really cared to, but it does work. Um, I have the Apple camera. What is it called? Quick Take. I have the second version mm. of that. That works. I've booted that up, taken some pictures with it. It is uh, horrible, but <laughs> it's cool because it's like a weird Apple product. I've got all my old products except for that iPod, pretty much. So yeah, I mean, you've given you've given me I mean, geez, you've given me an idea. I think I'm gonna set up like a 2006 era Ugh. ultimate desk setup. Please that do. That just sounds cool. That just sounds fun. Get, I'm gonna, um, I think I'm going to try to do get that. Get those, uh, what are, is it Harman Kardon, those sound sticks that everybody sound had sticks. back then? I actually have the, those. The clear so. ones. There, oh, there you go. Yeah. And then set up, get an Apple Cinema display. Get, oh, here's what you got to do. You got to get that classic, that big old white mechanical Apple keyboard. There's a wireless Ooh, version of it too. used to have those and in my old college. mouse. Yeah. yeah. So I set that up and then we'll report back when Matt gets that up and running in a couple of weeks or months or whenever he does it. But, oh, man, that's... I'm going to do anyway, that. that was, that's going to be fun. That with the cinema display, that's so yep. cool. I, I saw that video, and that got me down a rabbit hole. There were a couple of videos online of people like, here are the connectors you need to get this working with a modern Mac. And yeah. it's like dual link DVI to an adapter and then to a hub, then to USB. C. It's. Like, I mean, it's a mess, it's but a, you can it's get a mess. it to work at the very least. <laughs> oh, or just uh, get a older Mac and just plug it in. You're good to go. I mean, the older... Remember uh, those laptops used to have mini DVI, just... Anyways, crazy. Well, I think they at that era they did have Mac Minis, so maybe I can get. They did no, they totally had. I'm sure I'd have to go back. I just watched that event too out of curiosity. And I think they showed it off with a Mac Mini, so you could definitely. Um, that might be the cheapest way to do this. Get a so, Mac Mini and uh, do that. Oh man, that's so cool! All right, that got me excited. Um, the <laughs> other thing, Matt, I owe you kudos for that. I also love is this uh, anti glare matte screen protector. Oh, that oh, when you were out here, you showed us. Uh, at our uh, big uh, John Rettinger shoot, this anti-glare matte screen protector, and I got one for like eight bucks on Amazon. It's fantastic. I messed up the installs. So, like I, I ordered a replacement they're going to send, but I still have it on right now. There's some air bubbles and stuff and some like gunk, but really, really nice. It's nice. Uh, I love that it repels fingerprints. It's got a nice matte anti-glare finish. Um, for eight dollars, it's like one of the best iPhone accessories I picked up in a while. Maybe we'll leave it linked in the description of this podcast. We'll yeah. figure that out afterwards, but it's really, it's yeah, we well worth the money. Yeah. And I got to get shout out to uh, Jared Ramirez over on YouTube. He made a video and it just popped up in my feed that actually almost at 400,000 views right now, but basically said like, I tried a matte screen protector for a week, which doesn't sound that exciting, but I haven't used a matte screen protector in such a long time. And I just gave it a shot. And yeah, I love it. The great thing about this one is first, I mean, affordable. So if you hate it, it's 10 bucks. You'll be fine. Um, the other thing I like about it is that there's not a cutout for the notch. Instead, it's just not matte in that section. So Face ID will still work. And that's one of my biggest gripes is that when you put it on a screen protector, you can like see that there's a screen protector there. This one does a very good job of hiding that which I really like. I've had it on there for a few weeks now. It's a little scratch, but so is my actual screen. I'm not really too worried about that. And it's so affordable that at some point I'll just replace it. I actually ended up getting one for my iPad mini too. Um, Ooh. And I mean, it's not, it's just a matte screen protector. And this one does have the cutout for the camera, which is a little disappointing, but eh, it's fine. Um, but yeah, I'm all in on the uh, matte life right now, uh, which kind of makes sense. Cause when we had uh, in the, in our, Tesla's we had the matte screen protector over the display there and that's excellent because you don't get the fingerprints you don't get the glare so I, I guess I just forgot that I could do this I mean I don't know were you the same way as I was back in the iPhone days now let's go back another nostalgic path Oof. did you let's buy go. a ton of cases and accessories and stuff like that like I did you remember like just man I think of like 2009 2010 tech YouTube was cases. It was all about iPhone cases. Yeah, and then definitely. it would turn into iPad cases. It was just like case manufacturers. That's when the big giants became the giants there today. Griffin, Spec, Spigen. 
You remember these, uh, Switch Easy? Uh, Switch Easy, uh, Tech tw- well, Tech Twenty. I don't know if that's a newer one, but there's no, a bunch of like. New. Um, just the, like the, uh, Mophie, that's when they sort of took off with those Mophie, battery dude, bank yeah. cases. And it just, uh, I did, I had a number of those in the screen protectors as well, because, you know, back then you wanted to keep that iPhone in pristine condition. And I forgot, I think I had some Incipio cases. I'm trying to remember what Incipio, cases I had. Yep. And there was always, you know, the difference between like the hard shell case and like the more like silicone sort of soft touch rubbery material. And, um, did you watch, crazy. Uh, did you watch It's It's Me Morpheus on YouTube? No, I know that uh, he was really big back then. It wasn't like he really big in cases, but no, I'd never watched that oh, channel. That's, yeah, that's all he did was cases pretty much. Um, and that's kind of what got me into YouTube. Like my very first YouTube video ever is a direct ripoff of his videos. Uh, so lots of props to him, although he unfortunately passed away. But I'm looking at Switch Easy because um, they were some of my favorite cases back in the day. I don't know if you'd seen this one. It's like, it's a silicon case, but then it has like ribs on it. That's like a separate case that latches onto it. And it just has a really cool design. Uh, and they also are, that was back in the day when most cases that you bought also shipped with a screen protector. So it was like, you get the full protection in one. Those were the days. I mean, I would I, like to know, I'd love to know in our audience, you guys got to comment below. How many of you guys are newer, more modern Apple fans who just sort of are either younger in age, which is totally fine, or you just sort of jumped on the Apple bandwagon later, or how many of you have been around, I'm sure people have been around much longer than us, but like those mid-2000s or those early 2000s, like when the iPhone was launched and sort of those older Macs, um, I'd love to know sort of when you guys joined the Apple ecosystem, so to speak. Let us know down below because... I'd love to do an episode where we just um, reminisce about all these older Apple products. Cause I have so many fond memories of uh, just the early days of the iPhone and even the iPad and the Mac and photo booth and comic life. And remember you'd walk into the Apple store and you know, they have all those different sections, but then in the middle was just rows of software, just boxes and yep. boxes of software <laughs> you could get and before any kind of app store and just, uh, it just uh, fills my heart with a warmness of good memories from back then. And, uh, the Apple Store, I just remember as a kid, was always, I always wanted to go there. I always wanted to hang out there. It was yep. so unique. And it still has that same sort of presence today. Um, and just uh, uh, f- fond memories. That's all I can say is just fond memories. Yeah, exactly. And th- that was the day when technology was still kind of exciting. I mean, granted, it's still very exciting today for certain things. But it's like there was no leaks. There's no rumors. Or maybe I just wasn't paying attention to it. But it was just... It was much more. Well, the internet uh, was just still fun. in its infancy. Like I, I don't remember, you know, back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. You know, there were tech blogs that were doing this, but I don't remember like YouTube channels. Besides, probably John, who was That's covering yeah. leaks and rumors with the Techno Buffalo channel. But it was much more. It was just. It, it was way different than it is today. There weren't uh, renders and concepts on YouTube and all this stuff. It was just like much more. Um, I don't know. You just you. Raw, you sort of, yeah, it it was raw. raw. You more, there was just, it wasn't, you weren't as dialed in as you were today. Of course, there were forums and threads, and there were still websites covering this stuff, but it wasn't to the extent that it is today. And there was just something a little bit different about it that made those Apple products a little bit more unique, I guess. I don't know. Apple still's got a lot of the same magic and stuff, but that there was something about that era was just a little bit different that you just, I don't think you could ever get anymore these days. Yeah, I mean, I guess we kind of have some news on this VR headset, right? And you want to run us through that, which potentially could give us that same excitement. I'm I'm hesitant, I'm doubtful, but maybe. I mean, I'm, you were just trying to look forward, like what can bring that excitement back? And that, if anything, maybe is it. So what, is there any news on that? I, yeah, I so Apple that. finished up some engineering validation tests, basically like some pre-production tests to make sure that the headset can be manufactured at scale. And I just Actually, read this morning that <laughs> they're supposed to start production of this, I think it was uh, uh, between August and September. So kind of late summer, or maybe it was July and August, basically for in the summer uh, going into the fall is when mass production is rumored to ramp up on this headset. And again, I saw just if you're curious, still like a $2,000 rumored price tag. So again, it is not going to be cheap, but this is again, supposed to be one of those things that is going to be new. And I, I think about this with so much excitement because so little has leaked that there is so much we don't know that I really cannot wait to see what this thing is going to do. And, you know, Apple must be so happy too, because this is one of those products that they can really give a proper introduction and really introduce it as they see fit. Something they so rarely get to do these days with so many leaks and rumors. The iPhone, you know, when the 13 came out and the 12 and 11, 
we all knew what it was going to be like. With this, there's so little we know that it's really going to be, everybody's going to be sort of hanging on every word that is said because this is all going to be totally new. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'm still racking my brain on what it's going to be. We've seen, we've seen the like renders of people making interfaces and stuff and what maybe it'll look like. And it's cool. Don't get me wrong, but I'm trying to think of why it's going to be any different than like an Oculus or why it's going to be any different than, for instance, that headset that we have at the office, which is actually, I think using the exact same displays that are rumored to be in this, uh, this, this, um, uh, Apple VR headset, which is a Sony, like, uh, what's it called? A micro OLED? Micro OLED. Yeah. Micro OLED. So. Yeah. 5k displays. I think it's, rumored to be the exact same display so i've actually with my own eyes seen this display and it i mean it looks good but like it's not it still just feels like a vr headset right so like what are they going to do i my guess is that the ar component is going to be a lot bigger than we might expect and even though it is technically mixed reality it's more so at least i think it might be an ar device that you can then switch into a vr device for like consuming content that's kind of my guess is that yeah we're, we're leaning more just because it's mixed reality. We're kind of thinking it's going to be basically the same thing as a, as an Oculus, but I think it's still going to be more like a magic leap, for instance, or a hollow lens that you can also just switch off into a VR, you know, to watch content, which actually makes sense. And I think is interesting things that are, are questions that, I mean, for instance, the Oculus quest, uh, battery life. I mean, two hours, if you're lucky, <laughs> the um and then you have to plug it in I'll, whenever i play it i just leave it plugged in to like a, a cable so it's like even though one of the allures of the of the quest is that it's wireless it basically isn't for me because i just leave it pl- leave it plugged in um the other thing is like audio speakers uh performance all that kind of stuff just a lot a lot of questions charging i mean USB C or lightning what do you think magsafe what are we going to see on this That's actually a really good question because whatever they put in this is going to be sort of the precedent moving forward. And if Apple does kill lightning in the foreseeable future, then there wouldn't be a good reason to put that on there. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Maybe it's portless. Maybe it is sort of a MagSafe style. I I could see definitely you don't plug this thing in. um, You don't plug it in with a cable. You have like a little pad or something you put it on that charges it. That makes way more sense to me. And this is really one of the very first times in recent memory I can think of Apple really building something from the ground up because like we mentioned last week, um, you know, iPhones, Macs, iPads are all iterations of sort of something else. I mean, the iPad, yes, it's totally new and it's a new product category, but it was an iteration of what Apple took and learned from the iPhone. This headset, this software is going to have some iPhone and iPad and Mac DNA, but it's a totally new interface. You navigate it totally different than you would an iPad, uh, an iPad or an iPhone, an iPod, an iPad or an iPhone. Um, the displays are different. The um, Every part of the UI is different. The speakers are different. I mean, talk about a personal device. This is something you wear on your head. I'd say it's more personal than any other product Apple has made. The iPhone is something you have in your hand. The Apple Watch is what you wear on your wrist. But putting something on your face, you are getting very intimate very fast with that thing. And especially for long periods of time, the battery life has got to be good. The performance has got to be good. It shouldn't heat up and make you uncomfortable. Um, as a glasses wearer, both of us, are, is there going to be a mm-hmm. prescription version? I mean, uh, lots of questions that need to be answered. And I'm sure that there has been so much time and research that has gone into this uh, to make it hopefully as flawless of an experience as possible. And I agree with you that I think that all the demos we've seen from Apple year over year have really always been AR. I cannot think of really any VR demo Apple has done because they always were doing the Lego AR stuff. They were doing all the AR games. It was always, let me show you what we could uh, sort of add to your real world. Let me show you how we could augment the real world. So I think that this headset is going to be sort of our portal into this augmented world. Like you said, maybe there's sort of a way to go into a theater mode or a virtual mode, but I feel like mostly this is going to be uh, very AR focused more than VR, though it's still going to be weird. Does Apple expect you to walk out of your house with these headsets, this headset on your face? Is it something you wear at home? I have so many burning questions I'd love to ask. I still think, you know, props to Joanna Stern at that one interview where she asked Craig Federighi point blank, how's the software going on the headset? Um, (laughs) And of course he denied any kind of knowledge on that, but I just, I'm so (laughs) curious. And finally, 2022, this is the year that we finally see it. 
Do you think or do you still think WWDC? I mean, that makes the most sense, right? I but I also feel like this be. thing does this thing warrant its own event? Because there is so much to cover with this that I don't know if they could condense it down to twenty minutes. That's true. I mean, yeah, because if they did include it in WWDC, I mean, typically WWDC is like what a two hour event. So I mean, we're expecting Macs there. We're expecting like the new Mac Pro. We're expecting new displays. Obviously, all the software plus this that might be a might be a bit much. But I could possibly see them doing a sneak peek kind of thing, um, and then kind of like what they did with the Apple Watch. Like they announced it. Like here's the thing, and then later on they did like a full demo of everything, announced the prices and all that kind of stuff. I could see that being possible, but yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm. I'm hopeful because, you know, Apple typically doesn't release things that aren't ready, if that makes sense. So, like, even if it's not quite good enough, then, um, like, it's not going to be perfect, obviously. The next iterations are going to be better than this first generation model. Um, But usually when they release something new, it does work as intended. It's just maybe, you know, it's a little limited in certain ways. But I'm worried that those limitations are going to kind of kill this device or any use cases for this device because... If it is AR focused, which I think it will be, I mean, the only reason I care about AR is when I can have it in my glasses and like go in the real world. Mm. And I'm, I mean, I'm just not going to be wearing this headset. It's not going to happen. I mean, I'm saying that now. So hold me to it. I'm sure at some point I will wear this outside if that's even possible. I don't know. That might, it might not even be possible with this device. Um, I don't know. So many questions. The worry I have though, is that we might get like an Apple watch situation where You know, the first Apple Watch, they tried to do too many things with it and Mm. nothing was great. Like the hardware was good, but it was slow. The software was good, but it was clunky and slow. Um, It was nice that they added apps, but they were kind of silly apps that no one wanted. And nothing was really great about it. And it took year a few iterations to you know really hone in and no we're going to focus on fitness we're going to focus on notifications and um you know give you some more watch faces and that kind of thing like it's a very basic device if you really get down to it the apple watch um and that took a, a few generations a few iterations for it to uh really get that way and i'm worried I'm worried that the AR headset is going to be that, but on your face. So I'm going to put it on. It's going to work, and it's going to be kind of clunky, and I'm not going to really care about it. And I'm just going to, you know, be mad that I spent two thousand dollars on this thing. Kind of. I mean, I guess another way to look at this is like the Siri situation. I mean, yeah, Siri technically does work for everything, but after time after time of it failing or not working exactly the way you want, you just stop using it. So I'm afraid that might happen with this. Well, that's the other question I have too, and I think we've kind of talked about before is you know who is this for for two thousand dollars it's expensive so it's not for everyone you're not you know the typical iphone buyer probably isn't going to go out and buy this headset not everybody's going to have this it's not for your aunt or uncle your grandma is it made for a developer or an enthusiast first and then apple releases it more widely but the other thing is apple they typically build for a much wider audience. They don't really exactly. build niche products. So that doesn't make sense unless they're treating this like a Mac Pro situation or a Pro Display XDR situation. That's like, well, look, we're building this for the pros, the high end of high end, spare no expense. This is what we're going to do. And then they're going to sort of build down from there. But it just... I, I just don't understand how it's going to work up in the lineup. I guess that would make the most sense if, if they sort of position this first as a developer pro focused device and they launch a uh, more streamlined, cheaper version down the road. Um, but Apple doesn't usually do that. They usually launch mass market products, Apple watch, iPad, uh, iPhone. Um, these are all made for everyone, not just pros. It seems like the headset is being positioned more of a big product, not like an accessory, like a pro display or even the Mac Pro. So that's just where it just sort of I get confused on this sort of trajectory of where we're going. Yeah, that's kind of I mean, we speculated about that a few weeks ago where I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the developer model because we have rumors of the glasses, the actual glasses that are coming. And that makes way more sense as a consumer product. You can actually wear them. They look semi-normal. So no one's going to, you know, be weirded out. They're wearing a visor on your face. Um, And I mean, presumably it's going to have very similar technology inside, right? I can't imagine this like kind of quickly next to each other, Apple releasing a VR headset, mixed reality headset and glasses like as two products. They almost feel like the same product to me. Um, but I don't know who knows their trajectory for this new project, uh, could be something completely new. Like 
I, like, I mean, like we kind of said, like these new uh, product don't come around very often, so they could do something we can't even predict. I mean, to your credit there, like we've talked about before, we have seen some major year to year shifts from Gen 1 to Gen 2, like the iPad 1 and iPad 2 are totally different. Uh, and they really refined and really sort of honed in on the best parts of the iPad design for iPad 2. Same for not so much the Apple Watch. Um, iPhone, you know, obviously iPhone, iPhone yeah. 2G to 3G was a big one. So maybe that we have the headset, then the glasses. But there has been so much speculation about the engineering that went into this headset, the, you know, the ramping up production and engineering validation tests. Like it seems like there's a lot more going into this headset that leads you to believe that this is going to be sticking around for a little bit as a more uh, mass market product than something that's just a, a developer kit. But I don't know. It just, there's so much unknown here that is frustrating, but also so exciting because we rarely get this from Apple anymore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess we've heard or like speculated that this is basically the replacement to the iPhone. The iPhone has kind of reached its peak and now it's time for something new. So in that vein, then it would make sense to have multiple versions of this type of product, because if it's really in their mind, in Apple's mind, in order to put all this development into it, then obviously they believe in it in some way, shape or form, which means they think it'll take over everything, which if it actually works the way it's supposed to, and which the way everyone's kind of expecting it to work then it will take over the iphone because i won't need to hold up my phone it'll just be in my eyes already um so having multiple versions of that makes sense i have the visor for when i'm at home and i'm at my desk so i can have you know the setup and then at my lunch break i watch a movie or watch a youtube video in my visor as well and then when i want to go out and go to dinner i don't want to look like a fool so i put on the glasses <laughs> Um, this is a very expensive future but it actually makes sense if you think of it as a paradigm shifting new technology rather like on terms of the iphone rather than on terms of the iphone 14 if that makes sense so isn't it isn't yeah. it crazy that before the end of the year we could be doing this podcast with our headsets on and oh. talking to each other and be like oh you know uh, let me go ahead and see i could uh, let me uh get, see uh matt here on a facetime here on this headset and it's like we can actually like sit here like instead of looking at the camera we're like looking at each other having a conversation that'd be cool and it's so crazy to think that Hopefully by the end of this year, we will have all the answers to these questions and we'll have the headset and we'll be looking back at ourselves and be like, oh, they were such chumps. They didn't know anything that was going on. <laughs> now we know all this, but um, so cool to think that it's, this is it. It's been rumored and rumored and rumored, but this year in 2022, fingers crossed, knock on wood, we're going to get it. So yep. I cannot wait. And like we said before, if you have missed out on and you want to be on like the cutting edge of Apple products and like you want to experience that first gen thing for better or worse... Save your money now because this is supposed to be it. This is supposed to be the next big thing. And here's your chance to sort of get in on the ground floor. And I will not make the same mistake as I did previously. I'm keeping this thing for better or worse because oh, yeah. I want to have the first gen Apple headset when they're super rare to find. And remember, I was an idiot with my original iPhone. When I got the 3GS, I, sold I like sold it, sold it, got a couple hundred bucks and that was it. Now... They're not really rare to find, but they're still hard to find a good, pristine iPhone. If you want I want to keep one, this yeah. thing pristine. I want to keep the box, all the instructions pristine. So like in 30 years, I'm like, oh, look at my old, my original Apple headset when we're on the 30th gen. Um, <laughs> we're, it's all implanted in our brain and we just like, yeah. up. we used to wear these things. <laughs> yeah, I remember the very first, oh my gosh, this thing's ancient. I had the old M2 inside. And that's the other <laughs> thing too is like, it's supposed to have, like you said, the micro OLED displays. It's going to have like an M series. I don't know if it's an M series chip or at least an M series equivalent chip. And I right. can't remember. It was like an there was a level lot, chip. There was a lot of speculation on how independent this was going to be because one of the biggest mistakes with the Apple Watch and is still kind of the case with the Apple Watch, but it's much better than it was with Gen 1, was that it was so tied and dependent on the iPhone for everything that it was so slow. Like loading apps had to load up from the phone to the yep. watch and it was horrible. I think that if I remember correctly, one of the later reports said they're making this much more independent. Yeah. I'm sure you're still going to need an iPhone, but a lot of the stuff's going to be run on the headset and not run on right. the phone because that was really the bottleneck with the watch. Yeah, and I think I heard that the the actual glasses that they're working on maybe needs to tether to an iPhone because uh, that's obviously much smaller and more sleek, but the headset itself has its own processing and chip inside. So... Yeah, that makes sense to me that that would be the case. And hopefully, I mean, there's obviously going to be a lot of processing need to be done with this uh, with this headset, but hopefully an M-level chip will be, able, will be able to do it. And since Apple has all the different stages in place, they got the software, they got the hardware, they got the chipset, 
hopefully it's going to be a better experience than the Apple Watch. Although, actually, now that I think about it, the Apple Watch is the exact same thing, and that was very slow. So, yeah, hopefully it's not tethered to an iPhone, though, because that communication just isn't quite there. Um, or maybe that's why they uh, needed 5G, so that we can 5G, uh, you know, millimeter wave between the headset to our iPhone or something. But, no, I don't think that's going to be. I think it's going to be on its own. But, yeah, I mean... Hopefully, I mean, I can only assume that as we get closer and closer to whenever this is going to be announced, that we will get more info. But at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if this is all we know until it actually gets announced. Yeah, there's like that wild theory. It was interesting from Mark Gurman, who knows Apple very well. He said we could see these new Macs, some of these Macs that aren't going to be at the spring event, at a May slash June event, which is very peculiar because if it was WWDC, why not say WWDC? So. Right. Maybe there's a scenario where we have a May event that is new Max, and then WWDC is like a really quick thing on iOS and Mac OS, and then like the majority of it is on the headset. I don't know if that's the case, but just a little that makes reading sense, into actually. the tea leaves there, there's something about that. I still think that I feel like this headset might deserve its own event, but if there's not enough there for an event, it would make sense to sort of shift some of these uh, some of these things to another announcement in May, and then sort of clear the way in WWDC for June. Who we've talked about this before. Apple needs the developer community to build apps for this thing. So what better place to show it off than at this developers <sighs> yeah. conference? So You've maybe got me that's the way we go. That, I don't know. No, that makes sense because I remember I remember reading that from German too, and that I. It didn't really click in my head the way you just said it, but it's interesting that he said a summer event rather than the WWDC because that's always the summer event. Is WWDC. Yeah, May slash June. What a yeah. oddly not so specific time frame because he knows if it was WWDC, he'd know. And you know, yeah. for all we know, maybe it is WWDC. But I mean, there's enough new, new MacBook Air, iMac Pro, and iPad Pro. Those three on their own that are going to get M2s and M1 Pros and Maxes, those could hold their own at a little event in May and then that would sort of clear the stage for June. So I don't know. I know so that makes much sense to me though because if WWDC they do the the software as usual and then towards the end of the software portion they're like, by the way, or like they start talking about AR kit and their developments that they always talk about every single year, which is super boring. And then once they get to the end of that section, they're like, and this year we are taking AR to the next level. And then boom, like some crazy reveal. And then this is uh, Apple Glass or I don't know, whatever they call it. I could easily see that happening. And then they spend a good 45 minutes talking about the glasses and we need developers on board. Here's the things you could do with it, that kind of stuff. Hmm. I mean, that would make uh, this year interesting. Although, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we've heard this definitively. It's not going to be in person this year. Uh, I can only assume. So it's not quite as exciting as like a developer conference where you can then go to your different sessions and then like mm. play with these things. Um, but at the same time, that makes a lot of sense to me. That that might be uh, that might be the way it goes. When do you think we see these launch? So obviously, we let's say we have a June reveal. Uh, do we see a launch at the end of the year? Maybe November or December, maybe a launch yeah. next year. I'd imagine that we're still going to be a little ways, probably like the typical Big Apple reveal four or five months from announcement to release, right? That's kind of what I'm thinking. I mean, and also with Apple's track record lately, they could say it's coming by the end of the year and it could easily be 2023. Like, yeah, I'm more excited that they're going to actually talk about it and show it rather than when it's going to come because who knows? I mean, they could be really efficient with it and have all the production dialed and the the, um, supply chains are all going to get fixed and everything's going to be great or... I mean, this could be a disaster, and we don't even get it till like the end of 2023. Production ramps up in the summer. Maybe a fall release isn't that crazy. Maybe it's because I don't think with the iPhone, if they ramp up production like in it was, wasn't it like June, July, August, like is when it really ramped up like a month before. So let's say you know they ramp up production in August. Right. Wouldn't be surprised if maybe September or October. Maybe iPhones released in September, then maybe this is in October, or November. That would say, seems a little ambitious, maybe, but maybe not all that crazy. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense to me. I right. Well, here's the thing though. 
I mean, it sounds like it's going to take forever I to know. get these things. I want to get them now. But also, it's already March, basically. We're at the end of February already. So these things are coming coming fast. We're going to get these new Macs. We're going to get the M2 chip. I think once we get those, we'll see. It'll clear up a lot of what we're expecting later on the year, this first event that I think we're still expecting on the 8th of March. So, I mean, once we get those first computers, we know the M2 exists, and then we can kind of plan what's going to be coming later. And I think it might clear up some of those questions. But, I mean, I think... <laughs> I think we've uh, exhausted those topics. Hopefully, we get some new rumors because I'm excited to uh, see. I don't them think so. I think that more, it's like almost. Yeah, I don't want that, the spring event to just fly us by, but it's like, well, once we get this March 8th event out of the way, then the momentum seemingly is really going to build for what is coming later this year. So, super excited yeah, about that. Exactly. Uh, as always, we want to know your guys' thoughts. If you have thoughts on the headset, the M2 Max, the iPhone 14, anything, let us know. Again, that number is 949 354 3508. Drop us a comment on uh, the Apple Circle uh, podcast YouTube channel. And if you could leave us a five star rating in the podcast app on uh, the Apple platforms, I iPhone, iPad, Mac. That would be very much appreciated. It would sort of help others discover the Apple Circle podcast. So as always, thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you for watching. And we will see you right back here next week for another episode of the Apple Circle podcast.